You're doing the exact opposite of everything I would ever do. your homework that you took on? You know, I was just thinking it's a bad habit because a lot of this is just stuff that I stuck in there and said I need to look at that later. I hadn't looked at it. I saw one of my MS patients a couple of days ago, and she had uh, a neuralgia in her face, and um, she told me it was worse. She said, it's a lot worse. You're going to have to do something about it. I said, okay. I said, let's go through your medicine. I said, how much of your gabapentin are you taking? She said, one. I said, well, you're supposed to take like four. She said, I know. I cut back on it to save money. I said, well, you know that's to help your pain. It is? Yeah, that's one. <laughs> that's directly tied to helping your... Oh. I don't like it. All right, well, I'll go back up. <laughs> Funny how that works. <laughs> In medicine, the major problem I see is I, I always try to get the patient to bring their medicine to in that bottle. And when they don't do it for a while, it's not rare that I find we're not talking about the same medicine. I agree. Uh, I agree. It's a, it's a, it's a big issue. <laughs> <laughs> well, having Sark bring her to breakfast or take her from breakfast may not have been the best idea. Well, I know. <laughs> that it's, it's convenient for him because he lives close to downtown. So that was my thought. But, and I've had him do it before, and mostly he gets here on time. But, uh, <laughs> They're, they're the more and the less reliable people on <laughs> and they fall into the latter category. Oh, here we go. 
Um, she is. She's a MS fellow in Dallas. Well, the data they gave her was uh, so we talk with her something like the neuroimmunology. It's not my head thought about it. When well, you finished your residency, the minister at your church. Uh, had a celebration for you. Is he still here? Is that what he's no, he's still alive. He moved, but he retired. Uh, and uh, for a while, he and his wife had a uh, RV, and they would ride all around the country. Uh, and then uh, so but he's uh, still alive, but not. Had worked and probably let me, let me introduce you. So we're very pleased this morning to have Dr. Sarah Qureshi, who comes to us from UT Southwestern in Dallas, where she is a uh, fellow in MS and clinical immunology. I guess. Um, and uh, before that, she had her training at uh, King Edward Medical College in Lahore, Pakistan, and then did her neurology residency training at Albert Einstein in New York. And it's a pleasure to have her here. Welcome. Thank you. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, natalizumab. I'm going to try to not say the brand name. <laughs> a lot of us know it as, uh, I'm going to say it just once, thanks, Avery. And we use it quite a lot in MS. And what I'm going to discuss is what we often worry about with using this medication is the risk of progressive multifocal deep encephalopathy. Uh, viral brain infection, we use the short-term PML for it. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're experimenting with in Dallas uh, in terms of different dosing regimens and what we've seen so far and what research we're planning to do. So this is a little bit basic stuff about metalizumab. It's a monoclonal antibody. And it has something to do with stopping the lymphocytes and monocytes from crossing the blood-brain barrier. And here would be the brain. So it basically stops them from doing that. And the way it does this is normally lymphocytes and monocytes have what we can call sort of hooks on them that help them hook on to other <coughs> hooks on the vascular endothelial wall and then pass through. So these hooks are, the, spec, the actual name for them is alpha-4 integrins. Uh, the ones on the blood vessel wall are the vascular cell adhesion molecule one. Um, and Hystabri, basically, um, uh, metalizumab acts over here, binds to these hooks, and prevents the, basically, cells from crossing over into the brain. And as I said, it's a monoclonal antibody against adhesion molecules and white blood cells. Typically, what's been studied is this dose, um, 300 milligrams every 28 days. And it's approved for Crohn's disease and relapsing remitting MS. Um, very simply put, it reduces the ability of inflammatory immune cells to attach to and pass through the cell layers lining the intestines and blood brain barrier. So just a little bit of history of uh, 
Metallogamab, it was approved for the first time in 2004. People were very excited about it. Um, then it was withdrawn in February of 2005 after three cases of PML were seen. Two of these were relapsing or emitting MS patients, so one was actually Crohn's disease. And then it returned to the market in June of 2006 after they had looked at further, analyzed the results from the studies, became a little more confident that we know how to use it um, and uh, we can take care of PML when we find it. Um, the number, exact number of PML cases so far is definitely over this. This was the last number I heard of, was 440. Um, and we've decided to live with this because, um, and use uh, natalizumab in aggressive disease because in a lot of cases it seems that benefits outweigh the risks. And of course we're learning to better stratify the risk for PML and manage it when it actually does happen. So the reason why we we tolerate metallizumab in spite of um, the risk of PML is because it's really good at, I'll give you the exact numbers in a second, but it's really good at reducing relapse rate, delaying progression, reduces MRI activity, and also shown to decrease vision loss, cognitive decline, and it's actually improved quality of life for patients. So there's a lot of good stuff um, that it does. Um, these are some numbers. The first trial was the firm trial, which showed that it reduced relapse rate by 68%, disability progression by 42%, uh, GAD enhancing lesions, T2 lesions, all reduced by really good numbers. Uh, this was the second trial, Sentinel trial. This was actually combination of natalizumab and interferon beta-1A against placebo and interferon beta-1A. And this was combination therapy, and this is the study actually where we had the two cases of PML. And again, it showed that relapse rate was reduced significantly. It's still better than injectables. Disability progression was also affected. Um, and then after the uh, two cases of PML came on in the last trial, uh, it was withdrawn, then it came back to the market. And since then, uh, we've learned to monitor patients really well. The first attempt at that was Streda. It was an open label study and basically a continuation of patients from who were uh, enrolled in the previous two studies and who were willing to be monitored. Um, and then what we have now is the TOUCH program, short for TISABRI Outreach Unified Commitment to Health. And these, uh, it's re uh, every patient has to be enrolled in this, and they really carefully monitor the patients uh, and make sure all the safety protocols are in place. Um, very briefly about PML, everybody here knows it's a Progressive, short for progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, rare viral disease, um, causing destruction of white matter, also demyelination. So it tends to look somewhat similar to MS. That's a problem. It's caused by JC virus, short for the first patient who was uh, diagnosed with it, John Cunningham, occurs in immunocompromised individuals. So a lot of times we see it in HIV transplant patients and patients on immunosuppressive agents. So now the risk of PML in patients receiving natalizumab depends on a few things that we've identified so far. One is duration of treatment. So I'll show you the numbers in a little bit. But the risk in the first two years is pretty low, and then it tends to go up. High use of immunosuppressants, they tend to increase the risk of getting PML by about three to four fold, and then exposure to JC virus. And that we can now, um, we can check it now by uh, doing the JC virus antibody test. About 55% of the patients tend to be positive. Um, so JC virus test, this came out maybe around 2012, I believe. And uh, once you receive a positive, then you're considered positive forever, because we don't know what it means if you swap back and forth. 
Um, but if you're negative, chaotic testing is required. The reason for that is about there's a 3 to 8 percent zero conversion rate from negative to positive. Um, we also recently started getting indices for uh, JC virus antibody tests. We personally, uh, at our center, we don't read too much into it because we need more information on what they mean. So either we uh, see, uh, call patients negative or positive. Um, in the future, we'll know more about that. Um, and just another thing, if somebody has had plasma exchange, uh, it's recommended not to do a test in the next two weeks because it will confound the results. So just going over the risk for PML. Uh, in JC virus negative, antibody negative patients, it's pretty low, so less than one in a thousand. Um, but there have been two cases of uh, anti-JC virus antibody negative PML in patients. One of them was actually at our center. Um, in the patients who are positive, um, they can be, the other risk factors would be whether or not they've been on immunosuppressants. And here, so no immunosuppressants and immunosuppressants. Again, even if they're JC virus positive, and even if they've been on immunosuppressants, the risk is pretty low in the first two years, so it stays the same, less than one in a thousand, but it tends to go up and over in the next two years. So three if you've been on immunosuppression, 13 if you uh, have been on immunosuppressants. And then, again, actually here is coming down a little bit. So the strategy, for using metallizumab in MS patients is to, first of all, select the appropriate patients. So you would go for patients with more aggressive disease who haven't responded to other therapies, typically. And also, you would feel more comfortable in patients who haven't been on immunosuppressants in the past and uh, who are JC virus negative. And then once you place them on high salary, we have to go for a lot of the close monitoring through the touch program and chaotic testing of JC virus antibody. Um, and then you have to re educate the patients and uh, your staff about early recognition of PML and timely management of PML. Um, and if I've seen two cases and they were recognized early, managed appropriately, and they really did well. Do you wait till someone has failed an interferon or a copaxone before starting, or somebody's got really aggressive disease where you go with just every to start so out with? Typically, so I'm at a very aggressive center. <laughs> so they actually do, um, in somebody with not even uh, the concerning demographics and even starting out early disease when you don't know if it's aggressive or not, they'll still put them on uh, entalizumab if the patient is willing. But in a lot of places, it is reserved for more aggressive patients after they've uh, failed uh, other agents. Also, for I would personally think for if you have the concerning demographic factors, African American males, they tend to have worse disease, so you could consider putting them earlier on what seems to work better. They don't tend to do well on the injectables. So. And then you also, I think, need to take into account how reliable a patient is in terms of reporting these things. Um, so, and the clinical picture, uh, ideally, of an MS relapse should look different from PML, but it's not always the case, and it's kind of tricky. But the the red flags are so MS tends to be more abrupt in onset. PML, if patients are not so sure, and it keeps getting worse for weeks and sometimes months until you diagnose it, usually. Uh, MS, usually it worsens over maybe several hours to days, then it stops and becomes stable. Um, MS will have the typical double version of neuritis myelopathy picture. Um, PML, Concerning things could be aphasia, personality changes, behavioral changes. Vision changes in PML tend to be the hemianopia sort because of the cortical subcortical lesions. Um, MS would be more optic neuritis. Um, MRI picture, 
of course, ideally, this is what MS would look like. So you'll have the much more discrete lesions, well-defined, ovoid, periventricular. Uh, PML would be much more less well-defined, uh, multifocal, involving white matter, uh, not always close to the ventricles. Uh, new fibers are often involved. Um, ideally, people a lot of times would say um, PML doesn't enhance, but in about 40% of the cases, it does. And both the patients I've seen in my center, they did enhance. Um, and then, so hopefully, when we put patients on uh, metallizumab, we uh, every time they present with new symptoms, what we run through our mind is, are these new symptoms suspicious for an MS relapse, or are we at all suspicious for PML? And of course, uh, better be safe than sorry. Uh, even if you have a very little suspicion, you go for first an MRI, but often they end up getting tapped for, to look for JC virus. So now what I'm going to focus on in the rest of the, this was just building up to this part, is that for some reason, Letalizumab seems to cause a lot of PML and not so much other opportunistic <coughs> infections. And there's been a lot of research going on in terms of looking into why that might be. And one of the recent papers that was published in JAMA, our center was involved in this, looked at this. And this was this year, just a few months ago. And what's been seen already um, in earlier studies is that for some reason, natalizumab seems to mobilize stem cells, which are the CD34 cells, uh, from the bone marrow into the blood. Uh, these convert into the B cells, CD19 cells, um, and can get from the ones that are in the bloodstream, they can get into brain, um, parenchyma, and after crossing the blood brain barrier. So we already know from earlier studies that talizumab seems to mobilize these into the blood. Now, what this, the reason, uh, what this study looked at was, could these cells be harboring JC virus DNA? And then once it's mobilized into the bloodstream, can it gain access to um, your brain parenchyma? Because most studies tend to indicate that JC virus doesn't uh, stay latent in the brain itself, so it has to be coming from somewhere else. So basically, and the reason for that is, as we discussed in the beginning, tisaprine work, works against the adhesion molecules. And it's not just the adhesion molecules that help white blood cells cross the blood-brain barrier and go into the brain, it's also the adhesion molecules that tend to keep these stem cells inside the bone marrow. So once these adhesion molecules are inhibited, these stem cells can actually move out of the bone marrow into the bloodstream. And if these stem cells are harboring JC virus DNA, then you could be mobilizing it into the blood. So what they did was they looked at so 49 MS patients from our center who were about to be placed on Tysac, on uh, Natalizumab. They had their blood drawn before starting therapy, and then at three month intervals, through a period of 10 months. And in the blood, we looked for whether the cells, CD19 cells, CD34 cells, were actually harboring JC virus DNA. And then there was one time blood sample from volunteers and then patients on long term high average. Um, and what they found actually was that 50% of the patients with these uh, in the prospective part of the study who were getting routine blood draws did actually harbor DNA, JC virus DNA, in either CD19 or CD34 cells. And then a lesser number of uh, this patients from 44% uh, from the one-time draw, blood draw on patients on long-term metallism have also harbored this JC virus DNA. Um, the number in healthy volunteers was less, but they did also uh, were found to have uh, some 
CD34 cells positive for JC virus DNA. It was only one, but then the number was pretty small. It was only 18 patients. So basically what they concluded was that JC virus DNA was detectable within these CD19 and 34 cells at treatment inception and longer. And so they proved that JC virus DNA may actually harbor in these CD34 cells in the bone marrow and was mobilized into the per peripheral circulation at high concentrations. And this could actually uh, be eventually go to the brain and cause uh, PML there. So just moving on to a different note, this was looking at basically the uh, possible reason why Thai Sabri is involved in um, causing PML infection. So we think it's from the mobilization of these cells that harbor JC by CNN. Um, and of course, if Thai Sabri is working properly, we think it should prevent these cells from entering into the brain, but it, it's not 100%. Um, so just moving on to another thing, and then I'm going to connect the dots in a little bit later, is that at our center, because of the risk of PML, but also because of frequent infections, most typically vaginitis or urinary tract infections, in certain patients on the traditional Tysabri dose, um, over the last maybe two years, they started experimenting with alternate dosing of Tysabri. So in the clinical trials, MS comes back if the Tysabri dosing is more than three months apart. So they didn't try anything more than 12 months, uh, 12 weeks. But um, patients didn't do as well at 10 weeks. So most of our patients were eventually put on either six weeks of Tysabri um, or eight weeks of hard Tysabri. Um, and in our experience, they did really well in terms of MS not coming back. And uh, if the reason for spacing apart the infusions was infections, um, the infections tended to go away vaginitis or urinary tract infections. Um, and so far, and I'm going to contradict myself in the end, uh, there hadn't been any cases of uh, PML in every eight week dose in there. So this was a, this is a multi-center study. We presented the first version of the abstract in, uh, at the AAN in 2014. Um, and very recently at Ectrans, the second version of the abstract was presented. It's an ongoing study. Looking at extended dosing, meaning every six weeks or every eight weeks of Tysabri dosing in multiple sclerosis. And the reason for studying this extended doses is because we think the risk of PML is pretty low with extended dosing. It's the theory behind that is seems like the immune system recovers enough to clear out any JC virus uh, presence in the brain, but it's it's not, the doses are not far apart enough for the MS to come back. Um, the centers involved in this study are UT Southwestern in Dallas and NYU, and then also Buckler and uh, Bethesda, Maryland. So, Basically, they looked at 81 patients on extended dosing, six weeks and every eight weeks. Uh, the longest duration of treatment on six weeks dosing was 36 months. Longest duration on eight weeks was um, 32, uh, 32 weeks. Sorry, this is also weeks. Um, and these numbers don't all add up because some of these patients were switched back and forth from six weeks to eight weeks. And what they basically saw was only 7% of the patients had to be switched to a more frequent dosing schedule, and that is four weeks, either because of breakthrough MS activity or because, of, um, um, because they couldn't tolerate extended dosing. Some patients have return of symptoms, like fatigue or bad cognition on extended dosing. Now I really tried to, this talk was on a short notice, I really tried to get the um, figures 
from um, NYU actually, because they're the ones doing the statistical analysis. Uh, this was all that was presented in both the abstracts that 93% uh, of the patients tolerated the extended dose, no breakthrough MS activity. Um, my personal feeling is I did contact a few people that if it had been statistically significant difference in terms of uh, no difference, no statistically significant difference in terms of MRI activity or relapses, they would have put that in the abstract. So what I heard back from NYU was that um, this is ongoing and uh, the goal is to recruit more patients, look at more patients, and the study is not powered to detect the difference or not detect the difference right now. But everybody in Dallas, NYU, this, they're very, and also in my last year and a half, what I've seen is people tend to do really well on every eight weeks. We have probably hundreds of patients on every eight weeks. Um, I, and I'm the person who looks at MRIs, seldom see any actually. Um, but again, we would like to have more robust, robust trials. And uh, they're coming up with a registry for high salary patients on extended dosing so that all centers can participate in it. So I think it will come out and maybe things will get clearer in the next few years. Um, so one thing is may have been set up as a non-inferiority trial, so you're not actually looking for a, a difference. You're, you're, in fact, hoping that it's not different. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the, the absence of a difference mm -hmm. is, in fact, the important thing, that, mm -hmm. that eight-week is as good as, as four-week dose. Correct. Because we feel the chances of getting PML, what we're scared of, are less um, in every eight weeks, but also some people get frequent vaginitis, frequent UTIs at four weeks. Mm -hmm. If they're as good four weeks and eight weeks, then there might be, the drug company might not like it very much, but there might be reason to put everybody on eight weeks if it's that safe. But I think it's, uh, I'm a little more skeptical always with everything <laughs> compared to uh, my mentor, so I, I would like to see the study first to <laughs> make up my mind. Sure. But I think he has so much experience over so many years that he's very optimistic that that's why it will turn in. So it seems to be kind of a, a I can't explain the statistics there because you have 81 patients and 11 of them get switched, so it should be oh, more sorry. than 10% actually. So some of them are switching back and forth actually. Oh, so, so they're being counted twice? Yes, okay. that's why the All numbers right. don't add up. Yeah. Um, because some of them are moving from six to yeah. eight weeks. That's right. So I, we, this is very preliminary stuff. Clearly, there has to be more uh, analysis of the data, and I'm sure um, I just don't have access to it right now. But uh, it would have been published if it, if it was that good. So, so what they. We, we concluded was alternate month dosing of natalizumab after, and all of these patients were initially on, for the first two, um, 24 weeks at least. They were on month, uh, this should be actually, this is an error in the abstract, it should be 24 months. But for the first two years, a lot of these patients were on every month treatment. And then they were switched to Q6 or Q8 treatment, and they concluded that the efficacy seemed similar, and 93% of the patients tolerated it without increased subjective or objective disease activity, and no cases of PML, now this is a few months ago, no cases of PML have been encountered on this dosing schedule, and a multi-center study is needed, uh, they're trying to coordinate it now. And then this is another story from one of our patients. Um, from University of Texas Southwestern in Dallas. So this is a 54-year-old lady with relapsing remitting MS for over 15 years. <clears throat> she was JC virus positive. So all of our JC virus antibody positive patients are put on uh, natalizumab every other month, um, except the very few who just really vehemently state that they can't tolerate the um, 
on every eight weeks because of fatigue or cognitive issues. So she, like most of our patients, was on every eight weeks. JC Hart positive. She was on cell sept in the past. Duration of treatment on uh, at high sabri for was just over a year. So technically her risk should have been low because as we looked at the numbers before, even if you uh, JC virus positive, even if you've been on immunosuppressants in the past, uh, in the first two years it's the risk is less than a, one in a thousand. Now for reasons <coughs> other than related to her MS. She was getting plasma exchange. Um, and she got it three times, five sessions each in six months. Um, and the reason didn't have much to do with MS. She didn't have another autoimmune disease. Um, it had, she was on Delaney and developed some hearing loss. So um, there was a, I don't, Particularly agree with it, <clears throat> but uh, there was a they were trying to get her hearing back. Um, so it was anyways unrelated to her MS or other autoimmune disease. It was a medication related reason to put her on plasma exchange. Um, she presented with that's why when I was mentioning clinical pictures should look different, MRI ideally should look different. It's quite tricky usually in practice, which is why everybody is so scared of, uh, and rightly so, of uh, putting patients on high salary unless they really need it. So she presented with insidious, insidious onset of worsening, dysarthria, balance problems leading to one side. And when you would talk to her, she would be like, I'm not sure, but I think this is going on. Um, and but over the next few months, it took us a few months to actually listen to her. She, and she wasn't 100% uh, believing herself either. Um, but then in a, maybe two months she developed, uh, she was, she came to our clinic and we noticed the dysarthria, ataxia, moving to the right side. And this was her MRI, P2. So I'm just putting, I just put in the relevant ones. So there's definitely hyperintensity in the right cerebellum, uh, right middle cerebellum, yeah, so. Um, in the, and then there was, you don't even see it too well, there was something here. Um, and then in, this is the post T1, so contrast and mass. So here you see there's something terrible near the wormus of the cerebellum. Then you move on, uh, right lateral cerebellum and the middle cerebellum, he doesn't go again, something in the wormus of the cerebellum as well. And then there was a little bit of enhancement here too. And at that point, the differential was, this is somebody who's on natalizumab every other month. Uh, she has this insidious onset of new symptoms. Um, the, yes, PML was in the differential, but so was immune reconstitution because every other month she was having her um, natalizumab removed all of a sudden. She was tapped. She did end up having um, and we treated her, I'll go into the treatment for this patient in a little bit. But so then we were faced with acknowledging that this is the first case of PML in every eight week of uh, natalizumab dosing. But also, and I always disclose to patients in counseling them that yes, we have had one person now on every, with PML on every eight week of natalizumab dosing. But then I mentioned to them it's an atypical case. Uh, and of course, the patient was JC virus positive. She was on cell sept in the past. Those were risk factors. Then she was also getting plasma exchange, and we think that might have played a role. And what it could have done is natalizumab, as we mentioned right before, it has been proposed that it mobilizes those JC virus. DNA containing cells from the bone marrow into the bloodstream. So it was doing that, and normally it also prevents them from going into the brain um, at the blood brain barrier. But now, when we removed it by plasma exchange, not only did we mobilize these cells, 
Now we've removed the pad, uh, the metallizumab by uh, plasma exchange, and now these cells are more likely to go into the brain um, and cause DNA. So that might have been a contributing factor. Um, we'll know more um, as more research is done into this. Um, finally, in terms of the management strategy, uh, pretty much whoever you talk to has a different take on how to manage PMR. Um, a lot of information comes from the patients with HIV because it's just we have more patients uh, with PML in that category. Um, so at our center, I think in every center, we, this is obviously agreed upon is to stop the metallism app and allow re reconstitution to occur. To help in clearing out the metallism app quickly from the bloodstream, we do plasma exchange, so usually five full volume exchanges. Um, and then liquids, it, it's uh, Dr. Katri in uh, um, Milwaukee studied actually how much of the uh, metallism app is removed by plasma exchange. After five full volume exchanges, which is what most people tolerate, five to seven, there's still some left. So the, that's the reason for giving IVIG after the plasma exchange, because uh, it's going to act on the same receptors as immunoglobulin, where the metallism app acts. So it's can block some of the activity there. And then um, this part, so that is all to remove the effects of metallism. And then once we do this, so this typically takes eight days at our center, and this takes five days. So roughly we're two weeks into the um, treatment. And re studies have shown two weeks is usually when uh, immune reconstitution begins two weeks after you re uh, remove metallizumab or stop metallizumab. Um, so this part of the strategy is actually to try to prevent or preempt immune reconstitution because patients who have PML and then super get superimposed immune reconstitution don't tend to do well at all. Um, and usually it's pretty complicated to try to figure out um, it is in your reconstitution because we know PML can enhance too. So usually by the time you realize that the person is getting immune reconstitution, it could be very full-blown immune reconstitution. So what we do when it's from hidden trial um, is high-dose steroids, decadron, solimigrol, um, and so if it's uh, solumedrol, it's usually one gram. If it's decadron, it's one gram equivalent, but it's, it's usually 160 milligram. So it's weekly for the first 12 weeks, which is three months, and then every other week for six weeks, and then monthly for three months. This is what we do. It seems to work. I've seen it work in uh, several of our inpatients and the two PML patients that I saw. But, uh, <coughs> Just from talking to people at other centers, some of them wait for immune reconstitution uh, to happen and then treat it with steroids. Um, I personally don't, I haven't seen done that, so I don't know. But um, at my center, it's the doctor I live from, and he says he's made that mistake in the past. And by the time you figure out it's immune reconstitution, it's full blown and really hard to come. When you say it works, <clears throat> do you mean that the the uh, abnormalities on imaging stabilize, or do they regress? So the ones that I've seen, I've seen two of these personally. They did, uh, they regressed. And I think we should publish this because there's such paucity of data. Um, the first patient actually uh, returned to baseline. The second one. She's been treated right now. She is almost there, almost there. So, I mean, often you live with the dilemma of what to do next. 
And usually these are patients who are on aggressive, have aggressive disease anyways, that's why they're on the um, What we're doing a lot of, and I think we'll see the results in the future, is use a rituximab, which is, I mean, we just have phase two studies for MS, and nothing went forward, I guess, because some people say it wasn't lucrative to look at rituximab, but it uh, seems to work really well. Um, to prevent the, the biggest concern is it's not a humanized form of monoclonal antibody, so you get a lot of allergic reactions. We give it with steroids. Most people don't get any allergic reaction. Most, it seems to work really well in our patients. And for some reason, it's, yes, it's immunosuppressant, it's also a monoclonal antibody. It doesn't seem to work through this mechanism. Uh, Nitalizumab seems to have something Maybe not this exact mechanism, but for some reason it causes PML a lot. So rituximab, it's nobody with MS has had PML on rituximab, to my knowledge. Um, and I think you would agree, Dr. Hutchins? I haven't heard yeah. of any cases. Yeah. So keep so our fingers crossed. Keeping our fingers crossed too, but uh, for some reason it's not so, it doesn't cause PML that much. Do we know what the lifetime of the antibody is in the circulation or how long it stays bound to surface receptors? I was looking at that last night. So the half life is pretty <coughs> low. It's 11 days. But it's, it's, it stays in there for because disease doesn't come back. MS, just from looking at the clinical trials, it doesn't come back until three months. So right. some effect is there. Because otherwise you would make the argument if it's already gone. Right. Why would it, first of all, be effective in preventing MS from coming back? Right. But why would our plasma exchange also? Yeah, but you might have yeah. to look not just at serum detection of it. You might have to also look, you know, do it in an animal model and look at, at you know, can you detect antibody that's still on bound to, it may bind so tightly to the cell surface receptors that it sticks around its, its dynamic or pharmacodynamic yeah. half-life is much longer depending on how quickly those are uh, recycled or uh, resynthesized. And so it might have a much longer biological half-life, or it might be that it changes the receptors in such a way that they're non-functional for a certain period of time. So, you know, to me that mechanism is still kind of mysterious. And so why does it work for four weeks or eight weeks, but not longer than that? Initially, when uh, Dr. Froman, who's my mentor, was experimenting with different dosing options, who were placed on every 12 weeks, mm -hmm. but they're very few, though, um, and they, they've done well, so they're on it. But uh, in clinical trials, 12 weeks was the number when disease came back. So. Let me ask. Um, just to clarify in my mind, so we have about 80 patients in the trial so far? 81, yeah. 81. Um, this patient with PML was not in the trial? Mm -hmm. no, okay. she was not. Um, uh, but how many total would be on this regimen at your center? You said about 100? I'm guessing, yeah, more than 100, actually. Uh -huh. And what percentage would be JC negative as opposed to JC positive? In our center? Uh -huh. I would think roughly half of them are JC positive and half of them are negative. Mm -hmm. um, and I am involved with checking labs a lot and seeing a lot of the patients, so I think it's a pretty, this is something I would um, have a good sense of. Mm -hmm. so roughly half of them. Uh, so what I'm leading up to is if you were going to compute what the baseline rate would be to develop PML in that group of 100 patients, if they were on the traditional regimen, it would be like one out of 500, something like that, mm -hmm. and you have one case. Mm -hmm. And so if you get another case, are you going to quit the study? Well, so we still have patients on uh, every four weeks, right? Yeah. We would just I think we would be more careful about putting people on every eight weeks. Right now, anybody 
before we had this case, our counseling session was very clear to the patients. We haven't seen it at all. But every eight weeks, the patients were like, yes, let's go with it. But uh, mm -hmm. I think we'll be using, in our aggressive cases, and we'll be using more of rituximab. Mm -hmm. uh, if we can get it approved as compared to Thysabri, um, which is what we're doing somewhat of. But it's hard to get rituximab approved. It's just one more thing to take into consideration. But, I mean, we have a lot of severely disabled patients, too, just uh, from watching Dr. Elliot Foreman's patients. A lot of them have stayed for 20 years, and we realize MS by itself is really bad, too. So it's being, it's really hard, but it's due to weigh disability from MS against the risk of PML. A lot of patients are very reliable. A lot of our patients are very, very reliable. In the HIV population, it can be more challenging. They can be, I mean, just on drugs, other things that go with it. Also, they can have HIV encephalopathy, so <coughs> they can be somewhat complicated. Our patients usually report to us right away if they have something new. And we're not as good as we should be. Like I said, it took us a while in this case to figure out she had PML, but um, now we're on high alert, so mm -hmm. we do the, bring them in, talk to them in detail, examine them, do the MRI, um, if needed, do the test. Um, but I mean, PML is really scary, but it's not that common. But uh, a lot of times, we have so many patients who are severely disabled because they were there from the time when we didn't have the So. This is a great presentation. Thank you very much. And I might add that we have switched probably 10, 15 patients from Tysabri who were JC virus positive, and uh, two of them did horribly. Uh, just had severe exacerbations, hospitalized, you know, bed bound for long periods of time. And so it does make you think closely about the risk of continuing uh, if there's a 20% chance they're going to do horribly. Uh, if you take them off Tysabri, then you're really tempted to go ahead and take that chance with PML. Uh, what are your statistics when you do take people off Tysabri, you switch them to Jelenia? What percent of them do well? So this happened before I started my fellowship. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm hearing about it. I didn't exactly get to see this. Um, there was one person at our center who, and nobody knew better at that time, switched all of her JC virus positive um, patients on Tysabri to Jelenia when Jelenia first came out. And uh, it was roughly around the same time that we got the JC virus antibody test, too. So she put all her patients on Jelenia. And then they, a large proportion, I wouldn't be, I can't come up with the exact number accurately, but about half of them either had really GAD-enhancing lesions on MRI or clinical symptoms as well. And we think that was from immune reconstitution syndrome. So coming off Tysabri is not easy either. So you can get what re rebound MS or immune reconstitution syndrome. But then they had a lot of patients to actually experiment on because nobody knew better. So now what we do is when we switch somebody from Tysabri to a lesser agent, we usually get, bridge them with steroids to, because the immune system comes back with a vengeance when you simply because you took them off Tysabri. So we put them on steroids, usually three days um, of high dose steroids. For the, they used to do it every month for three months. Now we do it at least for one month, the first month, just give pulse steroids. So some of it might not have been, at least in our experience, because they were okay afterwards, might not have been um, Jelenia related as so much as it was from coming off the Tysabri. Right. The other thing, now that we do a lot of not coming from Tysabri to Jelenia or Tecfidera or Bajo or anything else but going from uh, Tysabri to Rituxan, they seem to be closer to each other. Um, 
then the Gillenyard tech would go. Do you use a washout period now when you're switching from one treatment to another? Like if you're going to Tysabri to Gillenia, the, the, originally the company was saying, let's do two to three month washout before you start Gillenia. But uh, I know some people are saying now you shouldn't use a, a washout period. So we did in the beginning, but we got burned. Yeah. So we, we stopped doing that. Yeah. Um, but what would be tricky is, um, Going from Hesabri to Rituxan, uh, one would think there should be a. We, did, we just moved one patient uh, from Rituxan to Hesabri uh, because we moved him to Rituxan, then he really missed the Hesabri. It helps with symptom management, and some people they feel better on it. So we moved him back. So we came up with three months as a washout period, mm. but <clears throat> no, there's no data. Usually what happens is you try it on a few, one number on a few patients mm -hmm. and then get, either get burnt or you confirm as, as working. So. How did you make the diagnosis of the PML in your patient? I mean, he was already JC positive and you said with an LP you made a diagnosis. So if you look at JC virus PCR. So the, and you look at the... At the in the CSF uh, spine. Was a Copy, yeah, it's good. yeah. Usually you get the number of copies of JC virus DNA. So you check it by PCR. So this is the end. The person who was positive was that positive by a JC virus antibody test. In the serum. In the serum, which means you've been exposed sometime in your life to JC virus and it's possibly latent somewhere. Um, and active in Infection. The active brain infection is indicated by actually finding copies of the, copies. the yeah, not in the antibody, but the virus in the CSF. So if you you have have you had tested somebody with a PCR in the CSF on somebody with no symptoms, <coughs> knowing that it was possibly was that showing lower titers? I mean, is there data on that? I mean, there it may be a small amount of ongoing activity, but not really showing up. So usually. I'm, or is I didn't really understand. Negative? Nobody, I don't think anyone's studied asymptomatic patients doing spinal taps on them, though. Well, you have, an, you have a positive JC and you have But you, you, I think what you're trying to get at is could it be latent in the brain as well? Yeah. Could have been there before, and when you're just testing something that was already right there. And so maybe the patient just had a, an MS exacerbation or right? it's because of the plasma exchange and the withdrawal of the metabolism. Usually, we haven't tested it. <laughs> but it would be easy. I mean, half the people in the U.S. are JC positive antibodies. have antibodies in their serum. We tap people all the time yeah. to investigate mm -hmm. whether or not they think they have MS. At that time, it would make sense to do a study, seeing what percentage of them, my, I suspect none, are positive PCR. But it would be an easy study to do. No, but they're all the getting point is somebody that has been on a telecima. Oh, but this would just be, this would be without any, you know, without seeing any of that. I guess it's not a not, I guess it's not And yes. then, you know, long term, you could follow them. But, but we is, want to prove that none of them were JC positive early on. But you, you know that he's JC positive in the zero, and he's been on a telecima. And why not testing what's the activity in the CSF before the symptoms happen? Right, but you don't know, know it was negative before we ever So I would them. think so. Like, you want to know a baseline PCR negative CSF, treat them, and then recap them in a year. I do know that. Well, that's for the serum yeah. conversion, yeah. But the, I, I mean, you know that the patient's already positive. You want to know if, if it's positive and inactive in the CSF by a PCR. So, Dr. Archer? Or, might also have experience with this, but well, before this antibody test came on, so any small suspicions would on a patient, any new symptoms on a patient with who was on Tysabri would get you a, a tap, spinal tap, for, and those were PCR. always negative. And some people, not at our center, did do periodic testing of spinal fluid. That's quite invasive to do, though. Yeah. But to my knowledge, everything was negative. A few of our patients had that. Well, I think the question was answered 
with the original trial, when the two patients came down with PML, everybody in that study was asked to get an LP. And to my knowledge, nobody uh, came back with a positive PCR. Uh, everybody in the trial. Now, a lot of my patients refused to have the LP, um, yeah. but uh, uh, we participated in the trial. And to my knowledge, nobody came back with a positive PCR. But you really don't. You, plus, this is active. Right. But, but you really don't expect that to be the case because basically you've got very few white cells in the CSF anyway. Um, what might be really interesting to look at is to, in those who are JC positive, seropositive, to take a blood sample and spin down all the white cells and get DNA and see if you could detect latent infection by PCR that, you know, they're clinically they're not infected, but if you can detect the by PCR, you know that there is virus there. And so, you know, what percentage of those who are seropositive have latent infection? I do know in, the, in PML patients, they're not always, <clears throat> most of them are not viremic. Well, they wouldn't necessarily even have to be viremic. It could be all, intras, you know, intracellular, very low copy rates, but they're somewhere. That's the thing well, with that this, too, that this study looked at 120 ml. There were a few prior studies that were looking at latent JC virus in bone marrow cells, right. and they never found it because it was eight times less blood. Oh, okay. So this was a large enough blood sample to look at it. Um, but again, it's we need bigger studies to confirm right. that. So they looked at bone marrow? Uh, hematopoietic cells to see if it, JC virus DNA is there or not. Um, and before, this is the second study to confirm it's there. The earlier studies looked at very small samples. So we think it wasn't enough to um, power, power the study to look at it. Well, there's lots and lots and lots of bone marrow around here. <laughs> Yeah, it's true, actually. All the myeloma patients, uh, it would be a great collaboration because they're doing bone marrows all the time. And as a secondary study, and I don't know with all the immunosuppressants that they use, whether they see much PML. Um, I don't think it's very much, but, but uh, it would be a nice collaboration. Is, is there any uh, relationship between the duration of the nasolamide treatment and the following immune, the severity of the immune syndrome, or is it random? It's random. Once you've been on high salary, it's hard to come off it. Yeah. It's, the immune system comes back, unless you have a different immune. Every, once you, when I first started my fellowship, I was actually, one of my questions to Dr. Brahman was, once you, one of my fears was if I put somebody off it, taking them off it, taking them, stopping the high salary is going to be an issue itself. But uh, then he told me about all his experience with putting bridging with steroids. Mm -hmm. So, but all these things happen once you have a new situation in MS, and you try different things, and something works. And a lot of times we get burnt as well. Sure. Sometimes you just have to fly by the seat of your pants. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. That was wonderful. Right now. Yeah. Thank you. Great job. Thank you very much. Here are those notes. Oh, thanks. What did her NCV show? Uh, she has a abnormality in her right perineal nerve only. Oh, okay. And the only thing I and it's axonal. The only thing I can figure out for that is that in 1960.